Yes. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started and uh, Tara will work on hooking us up too. Uh, anyway. All right, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we have a quorum and uh, welcome all of our visitors to the meeting. Uh, and I, uh, we have a new land acknowledgement statement that I'm gonna read to um, as part of the introduction of the meeting. We gather here on the traditional homelands of the four bands of the Spokane tribe of Indians, upper band, middle band, lower band, Chihuahua band. Since time immemorial, the Spokane tribe of Indians has lived and cared for these grounds, identifying themselves as flesh of the earth. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We show gratitude to the land, river, and peoples who have been fishing, hunting, harvesting, and gathering here for generations. May we learn from one another's stories so that we may nurture the relationship of the people of the Spokane tribe and to all those who share this land. All right. And with that, do we have any um, adoptions or changes to the, um, to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move along to approval of the April 2021 board minutes. I move that we approve the April 2021 board minutes as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Okay, hearing none, that passes. And now um, we need a motion for approval of the April 2021 bills and contributions. I move that we approve the bills and contributions in the amount of $4,426,777.66. I second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. And now we will turn it over to uh, Nicole for the financial report. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate it. Good evening. Okay, so for the library operations for April, the cash and investments trend, um, as of April for month end, we have 114 days of operating costs. That's in available cash and investments. Um, our cash and investments balance, which includes a reserve for capital and is net of encumbrances, is currently $3,879,618. And for our expenditure trend, our year-to-date expenditure total is at 26% of our annual operating expense budget. In April, we expended 520,618 for personnel costs, 54,066 for books and materials costs, 32,711 for routine services, 15,846 was for interfund charges, uh, 23,907 for utilities and leases, and 17,687 was for supplies and minor equipment. So our overall April expenditures was $664,836. Now on, on to uh, business office news. Uh, the, the city has made further progress with our new asset tracking system. They informed us that they, began, they have began testing their new scanner uh, with the RFID tags. So we're very hopeful in gearing up to have the, those new tags soon. And this April, our Hilliard branch experienced some minor damage. There was a window that was, that was broken out. Uh, we're, we're not really sure of the cause of the damage. Um, the, the facility staff was, was great. They responded very quickly to the issue. Um, and the, the repair costs are very minimal, only about 680 bucks. Um, and fortunately, no insurance claim was necessary. So I'm gonna open it for questions before I pass it on to Penny with the financial bond section. All right, thank you, Nicole. Any questions? Yes. All right, Penny, you wanna go ahead with the bond? I sure will. Um, just wanna comment, um, Matt Walker's just messaged me having trouble hearing the conversation. So once I'm done and Karis talks about signage, we might just uh, move beyond um, Matt. I'll try and keep you posted as, as I can get through my report here. Um, April, April was um, kind of the launch of all the uh, 
furniture and shelving purchases. Jim, you, you asked about this, I think last month, but um, the process generally is that group four put together specifications and the bid packages, and they identified the cooperatives that vendors could, um, if they were eligible to quote under those cooperatives, uh, provide us with quote packages. So the, um, it's broken down into four groups. One is public furniture, staff furniture, shelving, and custom casework. And right now the public furniture quotes are coming in like crazy. And the process for this, this is an audited area for us. Um, so group four, first of all, takes the quotes and they go line by line and make sure that the, the specifications have been met in the, in the uh, bid packages. And then those come to me and I work with the co-op to make sure that the vendor is eligible to quote under a contract uh, with that co-op and also that the contract will be in force at the time of our purchase. Both of those things are very important. And once that's done, I give, um, I let group four know and then they issue a formal recommendation to purchase. It swings back over to Andrew and I and we complete the appropriate documentation for that furniture package and um, it's on order. So uh, this will probably continue heavily for the next um, 45 to 60 days. And um, it, I'd say so far it's working out pretty well. Um, I wanted to acknowledge one of Matt Walker's employees, Lorraine Mead. She is um, she is a senior project manager and leads the Shadel project, but she also is responsible for putting together a master schedule. And <clears throat> it's incredibly detailed. This schedule is it takes us all the way through to furniture deliveries, the hanging of the art, commissioning of the building, transitioning it uh, from the contractor into our hands and the training that goes on with our staff on how to run all the systems. So just wanna acknowledge that really, really hard work that Matt's team does for us. Um, uh, in April, we, we spent $3.6 million in expenditures and we did not have any unexpected um, contracts that needed to be signed under the special uh, signing authority. So this month, we're going to showcase signage, wayfinding, experiential graphics um, with Karis O'Malley. And before I turn it over to him, um, the board um, approved a not to exceed for signage in an amount of $1 million. And you can see I've got those broken out by by branch, and we're we're pretty close to that one million. We're at nine hundred fifty-seven thousand. All of that's under contract commitments with Helvetica. We have had one change order for the addition of a shadow parking lot sign, and I I am expecting I have a, I I dropped a zero there, but it's thirty thousand um, dollars a change order roughly in that amount for the commemorative plaques. Um, so if we if we get uh, right against that $1 million, I'll have to revisit that with uh, the board and um, see if we need to, to request um, a raise on that and that amount. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karis. He's gonna give you an update on the projects. Thank you, Penny. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just spend a few minutes going over with you uh, where we've made it to in signage. It's been quite a journey and this is uh, kind of a big list. So I'm going to move fairly quickly. If you have questions as we go through, please feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, I will um, ask for your questions or input at the end. So let me share my screen. All right. Do we see our signage and experiential graphics? Yes. Excellent. So first thing I would like to share with you are the exterior signs that are going to be consistent across all of our locations. So what you're looking at right here is a monument sign. And what you'll see is uh, a unique color for each branch, but otherwise they're very consistent. So this is gonna be the first time that all of our branches are gonna be able to have that consistent external identity, no matter where we're going. Um, along those same 
lines, we have the library identification signage. And depending on the branch, this treatment will either be vertical or horizontal. Typically, it's vertical, um, with the exception of places like Shadle, where it just makes more sense, uh, based on the architecture, to shift the uh, orientation of the word library. In addition to those exterior signs that are going to be consistent across all branches, we have some that are unique. Um, across the board, the hive is consistently unique um, where our branches are concerned, just given its unique branding and, and different usage. So we see a couple of different neon signs on the hive, in addition to the giant letters um, that you all are familiar with. One thing that's pretty cool is we just had our uh, neon sign actually installed. So we got to see the conceptualization right alongside the real thing. And we were pretty happy with it. It makes quite a statement going down uh, Sprague there. And we're looking forward to seeing the, the giant letters go in in uh, short order. A little more boring, but still requiring important design work are the parking signs. So you see uh, what we've got here is one for Shaw that stays with the Shaw design for the campus and another for Shadle that also calls attention to our partners at Parks and Recreation and the pool. Uh, downtown or Central now is its own uh, unique beast, kind of, like, uh, kind of like the Hive. So you see our boring old parking sign, but also our super cool uh, light up LED marquee sign. And if you go down uh, towards, the, towards the Central Library right now, you will be able to see the steel plates that are being put up to install this sign. It's very exciting right now. On the inside of the library, we've got some, uh, some, consistent, uh, some consistent signage that is really necessary for us. So we've got our, our returns and our checkout and our information desk signs. The checkout signs are actually kind of cool because they're they're custom fabricated to fit between our self checkout machines and they allow us the flexibility to be able to move the machine and the signage simultaneously, which has been a problem that we've experienced in the past where we're kind of stuck with a single location uh, for those when we move them around. So then we have to figure out how to add signage retroactively to a new space kind of ditto with the information desk. Um, these desks are movable and they've got the signage built into them rather than suspended from the ceiling above them, which has been our, our typical approach. Um, our end cap signage is going to follow a, uh, a, a general template so that we can change these dynamically. Uh, what we see is that at SPL, we shift collections around a lot based on customer need and interest and size of collections. We try to keep things dynamic. Uh, so we opted for an end cap signage piece that could be readily changeable in house. Um, and in addition to this, there's going to be some experiential graphics also on the end caps, but we're still working through some of the details on that. But what you see here is in general, the high level category followed by some of the details down below, depending on what's appropriate for the collection. Um, we also have our code signage, which is, you know, the boring stuff that just identifies what room uh, you're looking at. So we see a couple of different treatments here. One um, is for the public and one is for staff spaces. So for public spaces, we also included the, uh, the branch's distinct color. Each branch that we have um, will have its own color that fits into the overall palette of uh, the signage program. And in this case, we're looking at the hive, which is this bright yellow. Um, inside the branches, we are utilizing this um, vinyl on glass consistently across all of the different programming and meeting spaces. And I'm showing you a couple of different ones here. Uh, the one across the top is the Shadle uh, event space. The one down in the bottom is the uh, Liberty Park event space. And next to that is an example of what this kind of frosted glass treatment actually looks like in the real world. So right now we're dealing chiefly with drawings um, and we haven't seen these things actually attached, but that's a negative version of what this thing will actually look like. Uh, what you'll notice also 
with the uh, the Shadle event space is we've integrated some experiential graphics into the vinyl treatment. So what you're looking at right there is a street map of the Shadle neighborhood that has been integrated um, into this vinyl that attaches to the windows. And we've done that in a couple of different places, uh, both in Shadle and in other branches as well. Um, moving on from there to the experiential graphics, uh, we've got a number of different mural type things that are gonna be going in. Um, some of them are uh, kind of, well, I guess the hive is, is really the standout here. So for every other location, we really zeroed in on sense of place. And we tried to integrate the personality and identity of that region of the city into the experiential graphics. For the hive, um, things are kind of different. So it's kind of livelier. Uh, you see this arrow concept that is revealed all throughout the hive. The, the arrows around the hive logo here um, are repeated on each of the uh, studio rooms as well. On the left side here, you see an, an image that is going to be a mural in Liberty Park. Um, and this is an actual photograph from Liberty Park. So our, uh, our consultants, Helvetica, had a professional photographer go out to Liberty Park in order to capture some of these um, iconic images that we could then repeat by kind of adding uh, treatments to the visual images that would make them more abstract and art-like, but also mirroring their environment. Uh, this is another example of the experiential graphics in Liberty Park. You see this topographic map, map of the park that is repeated both in the mural and in the, uh, the vinyl on glass down here that will be attached to the uh, quiet reading room. Um, this is another great example in Liberty Park of the, um, uh, the photograph of the actual park being rendered into a, um, a, a graphic, a, a modern treatment of a graphic. So in this case, you see the image of the, the columnar basalt that has then been rendered into a large scale graphic that will fit on the inside of the curved meeting room space. Uh, just shifting over to Hilliard, these are to be uh, to be determined still. We're working on them, but we're trying to harken back to Hilliard's history as the way to connect it to its sense of place. So we see some abstract um, Andy Warhol style trains, as well as a historic picture of the Hilliard neighborhood down there. Where uh, these are kind of uh, placeholder concepts that we're currently working through, but it should give you an idea of where we're trying to go with these different murals. And that is the uh, signage in a nutshell. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me that I could answer? Yeah, I have I a question. Have uh, the signage that we're going to use for the Salish name for the stage on the third floor, is that going to be in a similar kind of format and treatment as the rest of the signs? Or are we thinking that we'll do something different for, uh, for those? Ideally, it will stay in the same theme um, as, the rest, as the rest of the branch. And so you'll see, uh, we have not gotten to the design of like the specific stage names and stuff beyond, uh, stage signage, I should say, beyond the code signage. So that stuff is still uh, to be designed, mm -hmm. but yes, it, it should be in the same vein. Thank you. I have a couple of questions on the on the monument signs. Um, yeah. Where, where where are they going to be? Are they going to be at the parking entrance or near the actual entrance of the library? So for each of the monument signs, the key purpose is visibility from the roadway. So um, in most of cases, it's somewhere near the entrance to the parking lot. In the cases where it's not is where you see those additional parking signs like at uh, Shadle and downtown and uh, Hilliard. Uh, but in general, yeah, they're visible from the road and they identify the branch for passing motorists. And the other question is, does Central Library get a monument sign? Um, does Central Library get a monument sign? I think, gosh, Amanda, can you remind me? I can't even remember now. 
Central Library does not get a monument sign because the footprint of the Central Library doesn't allow for one. So instead, you'll see that really large lighted marquee sign on the uh, Lincoln main corner and a parking sign on the back side to indicate access to the parking lot and a library sign above the door on the north side entrance. But that's the only location that could not accommodate a mark or a um, monument sign. And on that uh, picture we had of the marquee sign, um, was the word central, was it, was, did it say central library or just library? Yeah, so when you're continuing down Lincoln, you see the word central along the marquee sign. And as you're going on Main, you see library. So there's a couple of key points where you can see both, but ordinarily you will see one or the other. All right, any more questions for Karis? Thank you, Karis. And thank, thank you. you. Uh, Penny, is Matt on with us now? I yep, am. He gave me the high sign. Okay, excellent. Well, Matt, then uh, we are ready to hear from you on the bond construction update. All right, well, uh, things are progressing quite well. You know, I was just thinking we're about a, a month left of construction before we turn into the closeout phase, which basically, commences with substantial completion. And so in next week at Shadle, they're gonna start doing a punch list, which will be walking around the, the building, making a list of things that need to be fixed or completed. And that's kind of the, the first step towards the substantial completion process. And then in a few weeks, about a month from now, we'll be doing the same thing at Liberty and Hive. And uh, so, that, so that's good news. Um, it's really fun to see how much has progressed out there. I was just out at the Hive earlier today and the parking lot is paved, the building exterior is done. There's yellow paint on the exterior and the interior, the sign is up. It's just really coming together well. And the same with Liberty, uh, Shadle and um, Hilliard as well. So projects are moving together or moving along quite well. And we're getting to the point where we're starting to think about moving uh, new stuff into the buildings that's owner provided, as Penny mentioned earlier. So it's a it's, it's an exciting time right now. Excellent. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Matt? Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the quarterly performance report. Report. Uh, Shiloh, I believe you're going to share that with us. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so I think you have the sheet, but I'll share my screen as well. Um, and pretty similar story to what we've had all year. <laughs> so first, if you're looking at it digitally, this is, um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can now. Okay. So this is a hyperlink, if I can get it to work. Um, that will take you to a more, a larger report that you can explore um, as you wish. It's always there and it has a table there as well. So once it's open over here. So this has all of the reports, um, but I'm just gonna go back to the summary for now. So yeah, uh, the first thing with this quarter is that gate count is not super reliable because branches were um, unplugging their gates a little bit just because of shuffle, shuffling around and our computer sessions count is also not reliable I think because of something with Envisionware um, and then curbside which we have been reporting on has we have begun to shift away from that which is good news because we're moving out of um, COVID lockdown so just at the top, circulation is overall down because of the decrease in physical circulation. Um, but again, an increase in digital as we've seen pretty consistently. And you can see if you look at, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but quarter one is the gray here. And if you look at quarter four, which I'll get to at the end, but pretty similar to quarter four, 2020. We've had a decrease in new cardholders, active households, again, kind of because of our pandemic, um, decrease in Wi-Fi and computer usage, 
decrease in gates, um, and then the curbside is there. But I think right now the more useful thing to look at is our changes from quarter four 2020. So we've seen a little bit of a dip in physical circulation. That's kind of just the trend um, that we've seen throughout that physical circulation is going down, but digital circulation is going up. There's been an increase um, in new card holders since quarter four, increase in Wi-Fi and computer sessions, pretty large because we've begun to provide more and more computer use in branches. An increase in physical gate count, even though the count has been off, so that's encouraging, and then a little bit of a decrease in virtual gate count, which is just website views. Um, and that just varies. I don't know why. I would imagine people are sick of looking at websites <laughs> if I were to just make something up. So that is all for a quick summary. Does anyone have questions about any of that? All right, thank you, Shiloh. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the next item on the agenda is the chairman's report and there is no chairman's report. So we will move on to the executive director's report. Andrew. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're uh, enjoying what we're reporting on with all these facilities and you know, getting down to some of those details of the signage. And for those of you <clears throat> joining us this week with the tours, you'll be able to see uh, even more of the progress uh, that we've made. Um, and, you know, I just, I didn't want to let this go unsaid, but uh, Amanda and Karis have, you know, really done a huge uh, uplift with that signage. So a, a lot of credit goes to, to their uh, work on that end. Uh, as well as um, Amanda was also great in great help in, in choosing uh, furniture. And she's been, uh, uh, really making sure that the brand is bleeding throughout everything that we're doing. Um, so, you know, when things are all final and done, uh, if you like it, it's all Amanda. If you don't like it, just look at me. Uh, no, she's, she's really done a, a great job in spearheading all that sort of stuff. So um, thank you, Amanda. Uh, as far as the report goes, I, I have submitted one uh, as part of the, the packet. Um, we are re-engaging uh, in trying to determine our 24-7 uh, kiosk locations. Uh, Paul Chapin is really leading the charge on this. Um, a reminder, these won't be the same uh, machines uh, that we have at, at West Central. Uh, we went out uh, for, for bids, uh, to, uh, for, for new vendors, for all of our self-service stuff, uh, and MK Solutions is going to be providing uh, that product for us. It'll be different functionality, but essentially the same concept of it's kind of like a red box. Uh, it's going to uh, give materials out, uh, and it's going to increase the convenience, uh, you know, throughout the city. Uh, we are targeting some areas in the city, one would be uh, Foothills Drive in Nevada. Uh, the other would be Shiloh Hills. Uh, Leta Valley, Eagle Ridge area is, a, is another area that we're targeting. And in Northwest Spokane, we're looking at areas around the, the uh, VA hospital. Um, so we've got some, some promising um, potential partners in there, uh, nothing official at this point. Um, but uh, Paul is, is working his magic to, to make sure that uh, we can uh, really fulfill what we promised uh, with uh, this technology. Uh, you're going to start seeing more and more uh, you know, programmatic stuff uh, that's uh, being released. Uh, things like uh, our artist residency program at The Hive. Um, uh, Amanda will probably share some information about that just as part of the communications report. Um, but these are going to uh, be opportunities for individuals or teams, uh, artists, crafters, musicians, makers, writers to really share in their craft. Um, it's a free space for folks. 
Um, and the only thing that we're asking of them is that they share in, in some sort of public program um, and, and actually be there at the space. So it, it, it's being utilized. Eva Silverstone's uh, heading up that effort. Um, so thank you uh, for her. Uh, the other thing that you might have seen in the in the paper is our new partnership with Sp uh, startup Spokane uh, was re recently announced. Uh, uh, this has been head up by I don't know you might have heard of him Mark Pond, uh, national award winning business librarian. Um, he got this award before we started doing this partnership, so I don't know what they're going to do next year. Um, I don't know if there's a two-time award winner in the history of this, but he's really trying uh, to, to get this. I have not seen a partnership like this uh, in, in library land, uh, and, and we are really lucky to have Mark uh, as part of our staff. We're also really lucky to have a, um, an organization like GSI and Startup Spokane that, that sees the value in what the library offers. Um, so we're setting the bar pretty high with this partnership and, um, you know, it, it's going to lead to, to more great things. Uh, Mark and Startup Spokane, I think that they're smart enough to be flexible in their approach um, and, and they'll be able to shift based on what's needed by the community. Um, but they've got a really solid beginning uh, to that uh, partnership. So. Thank you, Mark, uh, for getting that off the ground. As part of my report going forward too, I, I, I really wanna share briefly what the organization has been doing around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as a way to um, also honor the land acknowledgement that we've incorporated as part of our agenda. Um, the work that we're doing with DEI uh, furthers that connection. Um, so, uh, you know, what that group has been doing is we've been working on developing a mission statement for that group. So we really know, uh, A, what the point of the group uh, is, and, and we'll uh, be able to measure what success uh, is for that group. So we're taking our time with it, which I think is a good thing, um, because we want it to be meaningful. We want to struggle through what the intent of the group is, uh, because we want it to be meaningful. Uh, not just for the individuals participating in it, but uh, meaningful for the organization as a whole. Um, we've also opened up the intercultural uh, development inventory for all staff. Um, so just because of the nature of uh, the work that this requires of our consultant, uh, Tara uh, Ramos, uh, where we're offering up individual uh, consultations, um, we've really sort of spaced these out and, and done them uh, in, in iterations of, of leadership DEI group. Uh, and now we're, we're opening it up to all staff. Um, as far as their collections go, we're really doing a lot of prep work uh, to uh, move out of the Indian Trail uh, and South Hill because those will be closing down for renovations. Uh, so we've been doing some uh, extensive weeding uh, to get those ready so we're not moving materials that doesn't that do not need to be moved um, you know based on condition or just um, uh, they're, they're not needed anymore and this month's star uh, is really a group star uh, for our staff uh, Peter Anderson from our community technology department and Sophie Strom and, and Thomas Erlinger uh, they really came together and uh, found a way to provide uh, seamless service when uh, a, a line was cut uh, in the area uh, that everyone acted really quickly. Uh, we didn't lose uh, much access to the technology and were able to provide service uh, to folks, um, which is really important, you know, especially when we've been closed for so long. Um, uh, being able to, to continue to have a good experience for, for customers was really key. And no, it was not our construction crews that cut the line. Uh, this was a, another group uh, in the area. I also shared uh, our uh, opening dates uh, as well as part of the report because, yep, I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, I don't want anyone to lose sight of it. Uh, also, Amanda has sent out uh, invitations the day prior to those opening dates when we're planning on having 
uh, invite only ceremonies uh, to, to kick off uh, that opening. We wanna kind of separate that and just kind of create uh, the safe space that we need uh, um, to do that. Um, budget process, as Nicole had mentioned, is also starting to kick off for City of Spokane. It's gonna be a little bit different this year. We don't have an idea of what the deadlines uh, are at this point. Um, and I just heard from Brenda with the friends that we now have bookcases up at South Hill and Indian Trail with uh, items that people can purchase uh, from the friends. Uh, so we've been sort of putting that on pause uh, for a bit just because we were unsure, you know, uh, are we going to be staying open to the public? What's that capacity going to look like? Um, but we've got our routine down and the friends felt comfortable uh, offering that up. So uh, that is new as of today, uh, Indian Trail and South Hill, uh, and we'll be adding it to uh, all the other locations except for STA and, and Northtown uh, as well in the coming week or so. Um, we were expecting to have the city administrator uh, pop into this meeting and uh, introduce himself and say hello. Uh, that would be the first time to my knowledge of uh, anyone uh, from the city of Spokane mayor's office or administration coming over and saying hello. So he couldn't make it to this one. He's gonna be joining us in June, but I just did wanna recognize that, you know, uh, there was that effort of, of outreach uh, and something came up that he, he couldn't avoid. So uh, hopefully in June, we'll get to introduce him and you'll get to say hello. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll hear from him about what his goals are uh, for the city. Any questions? Oh, I should also mention, uh, we also, you know, it's become so routine. I, I, I submit a report uh, to, uh, for the, the trustees and then the governor comes out with a new directive. Um, I, I think it's a weird power that I have. I don't know. Um, or maybe I shouldn't feel like, uh, you know, be so self-centered about that. But it did happen again this month. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, uh, mentioned to the board that we have uh, changed our stance uh, based on the CDC guidelines and based on uh, the governor's uh, order, uh, we're moving towards masks being uh, optional for uh, vaccinated staff and public. Uh, and we're operating on a trust system with this because there is no infrastructure in place to really check this. Um, you know, we will we have been really fortunate over the past four months in the library that we have had zero cases of COVID with our staff. Uh, we hope to continue that, um, you know, uh, and, and we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, we want to be a safe place for both the staff and public. Uh, we just also just didn't feel it was very fair to our frontline staff to have to enforce something that had no teeth, uh, either with a local guidance directive, state guidance or federal guidance. Um, so, you know, basically agree with it or not, um, that's where we're at. Uh, and, and we're just going to expect people to be honest and, and hopefully that uh, you know, that, that will work for us and the community and hopefully we continue to see the cases in the community uh, on the decline. Any questions? I have a question. Are uh, we planning on moving out of Northtown in conjunction with the reopening of Shadle? Is that, yes. that's still the, yes, the plan that's on our um, we, uh, as far as, you know, there, there was some interest from city council to, to keep that, uh, basically one uh, city council member that wanted us to explore uh, uh, keeping that open. Um, we gave an estimate about how much that would be. Uh, we haven't heard, uh, uh, you know, that we were getting additional funding. Uh, and to be honest, the, the usage uh, really hasn't been there. Uh, I don't think it's actually been given a fair shot though either, just because 
hey, we had a pandemic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it just, it, it doesn't make sense for us to, to commit that money uh, mm -hmm. at this point. Thank you, Jim, I saw you. Questions about the kiosks. Um, are they approximately the same size as the one we have? Are they about, I mean, do they look similar? And I believe they're a smaller footprint. Um, I'll invite uh, Paul to, to verify that since he's been scoping out the spaces and I really haven't looked at the size in probably eight months. Um, they're, they're a bit smaller than the, the normal one that we have now. The other thing that's very good is they're all weather. They can be set up to where they don't need a big tent or covering over them. And uh, so that, that's quite good. And the dialogue is I can, I'd be glad to send some technical specifications so you can at least see a picture of it, uh, so. Um, I, the, 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 one, the one we have is really large and I just wanted it. And it's definitely larger than a red box. I would say it's about 75% of that space at that length. The other question I had, Andrew, is when we added that to the bond issue, we were specifically thinking of Northeast Spokane as an area um, that was, you know, farther away than from the branches than anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons. And I, I just don't, um, I, I didn't, I don't really know where those locations are that you mentioned. I, are they are some is are some of them in northeast Spokane? Yeah, so Shiloh Hills definitely fits that bill. Um, that's in the very top sort of northeast area. Um, uh, Council Member Fagan at the time of the bond, uh, that's an area that he was um, advocating for, uh, and their neighborhood council has been uh, consistently vocal that they would like uh, a presence. So we're, we're we're trying to make that happen. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully we can report on some positive news uh, in the coming months. And I would say the Foothills Drive Nevada space fits that uh, criteria as well. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on in that area too, which uh, you know uh, increases the uh, desirability uh, to to put a station in there as well. That's in the library desert too. Um, Shiloh Dietz has given us great information that Foothills Drive in Nevada um, is at the Logan neighborhood. And that's right in an area kind of a crease that we don't have a lot of good library coverage, the distance alone, so. All right, any other questions for Andrew? Okay, uh, so next on our agenda is the council liaison report, although I didn't see that Kate has joined us today. Okay, so we'll move on from that. Then uh, the communications report, Amanda. Hey, hi everyone. It's nice to see you. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, for all those really kind words. I didn't expect that, so thank you. <laughs> um, so this month's communication and marketing highlights include Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, we've been featuring this on our website and the events and book lists that staff have prepared were featured in the Spokesman Review and they're getting a lot of good exposure on our social media. I've seen them getting shared a lot. Um, Remelisa Culliton will, she's an artist, a local artist, and she'll be doing a Meet the Artist virtual event for AAPI Heritage Month tomorrow at 4 p.m. You can still register for that on Zoom. Um, and then tonight at 6.30, if you're not done with Zooming, uh, you can hop on a Zoom program with Dr. Melissa Bedford from EWU on how to choose AAPI children's books um, and other diverse children books, children's books to read to your children. So two upcoming programs that look really interesting. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, we also opened our call for artists and residency at the Hive this month. Those opened at the beginning of May and the deadline for those applications is June 3rd. Eva Silverstone's been doing a great job um, looking at all of, you know, this is kind of cutting edge, but there are a few other libraries out there that have done similar artist programs, meeting with people across the country to kind of develop our own artist and residency program. So excited to see those um, applications coming in. I think we have at least more than 10 now. Um, so, and uh, I'm sure we'll get a great, uh, great slate of candidates um, by the time June 3rd runs, rolls around. 
We're also put, we also just put the finishing touches on our summer reading magazines. Um, that's something we're doing new this summer because of all the uncertainties about COVID and summer reading programs. Um, Katie Ricard came up with the idea to do a summer reading magazine and you'll hear more about that at the next meeting, but those are at the printer as we speak. And so they'll be ready um, in mid June for students and youth around the city to enjoy. Um, I've also been really focusing on increasing the internal communication um, as I mean, as it's obviously evident in these meetings, there's just a lot going on from changes in COVID policy changes to the DEI work we're doing and to all the opening of new branches. So increasing the frequency of communication internally has really been a focus of mine, both in regular posting on our intranet, as well as more frequent staff wide emails just to make sure everyone knows what's going on. Because right now, I think we all know it's, it's harder than ever to make sure that communication is happening since we're not seeing anyone in person um, still. So really dialing that up as well and focusing on that as well. So on the social media front, um, we saw a 2% increase in engagement on Facebook driven by a, a question. These, these question posts are often very popular. It was, what book are you reading this week? Um, and a lot of people like to respond to those. And if you're ever wondering what to read next, it's always really inspiring to read through all those comments if, uh, if you're in a reading slump, a um, lot of engagements on those posts. Um, on Instagram, our top post, as usual, was a book face, and Twitter saw an increase of 25% increase in engagement, which um, was really exciting to see, and a lot of that in, uh, interest and engagement is on the posts about our high residency and also reopening plans, so seeing some of our followers really tracking us on some of those topics, and our YouTube subscribers uh, went up by 27 followers. So that was kind of a big jump that was nice to see. So everybody is not done with YouTube yet. Uh, so that's good. Uh, and then our earned media also saw an uptick in coverage because of all the activities we have going on right now, including articles about the Hive and Asian American Heritage Month. And Andrew was also fe featured in Library Journal um, on an article about restorative justice in libraries and our um, community court program. Uh, let's see. And that, uh, that concludes my report for today. Do you have any questions? All right. Looks like there aren't any. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. And um, now we will move on to new business. We have the capital bond funds uh, amendment to the SBL and Parks Department MOU. Andrew? Yep. So this is a request to execute an amendment to increase the value of the MOU that we uh, executed last February, I believe, February 2020. Uh, this is an agreement between city parks uh, to address the remediation of the tennis courts uh, in which we're putting the Liberty Park Library uh, in place of. The original amendment was for the amount of $175,000, uh, but uh, due to COVID, uh, parks really, they weren't able to do the community engagement that they needed to build uh, around their, their master plan. Um, and as we're getting closer to uh, Liberty Park opening and finishing up construction of that project, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to own that, uh, that uh, building of uh, whatever they end up deciding. Um, so it's, it's kind of addressing two things. Uh, one, it's giving the ownership of that project back to parks. And the other is increasing the value of the MOU to, uh, by $50,000 to $225,000. This will save us a lot of time, uh, uh, probably particularly Penny in the background, uh, doing uh, a lot of the, the public works uh, and, and contractual stuff. And quite frankly, we don't have ex you know much expertise in building recreational or playground equipment. This will actually align with um, where the library wanted to head with the MOU, um, but uh, we ended up uh, agreeing with Parks to, to head the project originally uh, just to be a, a good partner. Um, so there's a lot of positives uh, in our view uh, about this MOU change. Um, and it's a, 
uh, we're just asking for the board approval to add the fifty thousand dollars to the agreement. Okay. Um, so uh, we're looking for a motion to approve the uh, amendment to increase the value of the MOU from one seventy five to two twenty five. And so moved. Do I have a second? Yes, second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. All right, and next we have the operations update from Paul. And before uh, we let Paul uh, go into uh, his report, I just wanted to give the board a heads up that um, we'll, we're gonna attempt to bring more of our staff in front of the board uh, to give them a, more of an idea of what they're doing. Um, you'll recall we used to do that with our uh, community engagement ma uh, managers um, and our customer experience managers. Uh, you know, we did a, a pretty significant reorganization in leadership back in um, January of this year uh, after Ellen uh, left. Um, so we really want to re-engage and, and give uh, the board a sense of how uh, things are going and, and uh, get a better picture of who these leaders are uh, in the organization. So uh, with that, I turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Um, sorry, the light just changed in my office. Uh, uh, the sunlight's coming through, so I'll be a little bit uh, in the shade every once in a while. So I'm gonna share my screen if I can, and we're gonna talk about operations. So just a second. Okay. And uh, here we go. Okay, so the topic today is our operations side. Um, the idea of this restructuring is we had three community engagement managers and Karis uh, asked us to look at restructuring. And so Jason Johnson and I, we sat down and worked with Karis and I was asked to take over the, uh, the actual branch operations and the staff and the personnel that face uh, basically our, the public. And so the operations team role as it's evolved is at the start of the year in January, we went through and um, I got acquainted with three additional uh, CXMs, uh, the people that run our branches, our branch managers. And so the branches and the outreach function are the retail face of Spokane Public Library. We're where the public meets library services. And so just to give a quick overview of the uh, staff involved, I work with six customer experience managers, CXMs, who are branch managers. I also have reporting up through them as 37 public service staff, library assistants all the way to pages. And they're the ones who work to provide direct public service. And I report directly to Karis O'Malley. So what I wanted to do is give just a couple slides to indicate what our branch is, what our branch visions are. And what we wanted to do is kind of project the branches, the public service into the future. And so the first thing that we wanted to stress as a team is that we want to create the branches, the new programs, the new uh, buildings that we're going to be opening up, that we'd like to create it as a safe space. Um, we're going to be intro introducing something called compassionate security is our mantra as a team. And what that is, is thinking about security plus thinking about the individuals that uh, might need our help or our, our concern. So um, we're gonna be doing a lot of staff training and role playing to build confidence. And this is built uh, uh, around some things that Jace, uh, Jordan Hilker on our staff at Shadel has created uh, a good way of having our staff in a compassionate way work with folks 
who need help in the, in the system. We've also been talking quite a bit and working over the last year and a half about health and safety for both the public and the staff. And this was really tested during the time of COVID. So um, I'm really proud of how reactive uh, our staff has been and especially the uh, branch managers in helping the staff work through some of the different methods of working with the public. So we do have unique challenges for safety and security at the Hilliard, at Hilliard and the Hive and Central. Now Hilliard is gonna be combining middle school students with the general public. So we're gonna stay very close to Spokane Public Schools and what they need to provide a good experience for everyone there. And at the Hive, we're gonna be mixing students, uh, Spokane virtual learning, and also um, the artists and the creators that are there. So we're thinking about that challenge. And at the central branch, we're gonna have the largest uh, number of computers of any branch in our first floor. And it's gonna be a real center of folks using some of our electronic uh, offerings. So we wanna make sure that we're having a good experience there as well. So we plan to have security plus restorative justice practices. We've been looking at that quite closely. Andrew was honored for that uh, in a recent Library Journal magazine, but we'd like to affirm civil behavior as well. So everyone from families all the way to folks uh, who need a safe space each day to come and have a food positive experience at the library. So now one thing I'm gonna be evolving or creating is in its initial concept phase, it's called the welcome team. And that is a basically a three person team formed of security staff and our library staff members and also graduate students in various social service uh, counseling and other kind of disciplines that we might be able to provide an internship for basically help to work with our uh, folks that are coming daily into the library and also create just a, a good environment like a welcoming and also concern about people's uh, needs and their, their social needs as well. So second thing is we envision li libraries as a learning platform. We want to provide technology and Wi-Fi, and we want to really study what, what branch needs what. And uh, that means a lot of demographic analysis. We work very closely each week with Shiloh, and we really appreciate her and our IT team to give us that information. The other things that are very uh, concerning to us are computer literacy and what I call library hesitancy in some of our branches where Perhaps the uh, college education isn't as prevalent amongst the local population. People are fairly shy about uh, actually asking for services or feeling facile or uh, ability to use information. So we're gonna be really looking at that and how to introduce the library to a wider circle of folks. And one thing that's kind of the hidden feature is we do a lot of testing and proctoring now at our branches before we closed for online degrees across the country. So there's a lot of information there as well that we'd like to help the general public understand that we would assist in that area. Finally, uh, we're gonna be integrating with Spokane Virtual Learning Program, especially at Shadle and the Hive, and they're gonna be basically coexisting with, with us at the Shadle branch. So it's gonna be an exciting time there too. Now, as a manager of a group, one of the largest groups in the office, I'd like to make sure that we build a model workforce. And that means that we would build DEI into each one of our uh, human resources practices. I work very closely with Alan Wagner and he's part of our weekly calls with the uh, CXMs, the branch managers. And we wanna make sure that we study those practices. And when we hire new staff that we're thinking about equity and inclusion as well. Another thing that I've been able to do very well with our CXMs is sharing uh, staff and workloads, balancing the workload across each branch. And people have been quite responsive, but that's something that's gonna be a goal for us. Then one of the hearts of my mission for the last year has been staff development. We are, we've created a future leader and new manager training. Uh, Karis, uh, envisioned it as kind of like the people's university for the Spokane Public Library. And we've had 25 different staff members uh, take part in future leader training last year. 
And this year we've introduced something new for new managers. So they get a chance to uh, have like a weekly seminar on how to manage effectively. And we're also using the lean system led by Sally Chilson, um, working with our, uh, our branch managers as well. One thing that's really been uh, a great standard for our staff is that our local branch managers are buying into and helping me create operations and customer service. Twice weekly calls, we go over training, we go over just kind of like the current events in the library. So we share needs, we share concerns, we also uh, share solutions as well. Then the, one of the last two things is uh, being a community connector for a branch. We recognize that with our new spaces, this is gonna be incredibly important that the community at large feels comfortable coming in and using our facilities. And so outreach, which is run by Thomas Herlinger uh, there at Eastside, we have 104 sites a month that he serves. And we've begun in the last year, uh, started by Karen Nielsen to actually serve uh, Meals on Wheels. And we're up to about 10% of all Meals on Wheels recipients in the state, in the city are part of the, they use the library services at the same time. Daycares, retirement homes, we also work with those areas as well. So siting of the 24 seven kiosks, um, I've been using a lot of the city demographics and the library usage data to site those. And we envision each branch as a community learning center, kind of a crossroads of information. And we are very actively supporting local initiatives such as food distribution by Second Harvest, city dump passes from the city, student bus passes, even medication take back programs and broadband access programs. So we are definitely what I would call information ambassadors, which may be a new term that marketing communications may uh, give to our staff. And I think it's a great way to introduce what we do. And the last thing is we want to be seen as a contributor to Spokane's quality of life. Each branch is encouraged to build a vision to serve neighborhoods, such as Hilliard, for example, is gonna wants very much to be a job and career center for people in the Northeastern section of the city. And we've already had uh, folks like Providence, uh, Sacred Heart and Amazon asked if they cooperate, they could bring some jobs programs into the library to uh, basically uh, seek new personnel, but also to educate people about careers. And so we're looking forward to that very much. We also are gonna take a deep look at folks not using SPL services. How can we help them? How can we overcome hesitancy to use the library largely because people aren't used to asking questions and working with their own information? New arrivals to Spokane is another thing we'll be working on. We want to extend a welcome. Everybody who has a new library card, uh, we will have a plan to give them a tour and a real sense of the wholeness of the branches, what's offered at each one of the branch. And then finally, focusing with Mark Pond on the jobs, careers, and the economic growth. So that's a quick look at what we're doing as a group. And I'm very proud to lead this group and I'm excited to see the future of the library. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? I do have one question. Um, Paul, do we offer any services to people who are trying to um, <laughs> fill out any kind of Asian paperwork, uh, green card paperwork, or um, no, but, uh, any of that? No, but it would be an excellent idea. I, I have direct experience. My daughter is a uh, paralegal in Chicago. She does that all the time. So I have an expert that can help us design that. But the users of the computer, um, can everybody see it okay? I, I keep getting messages here. The users of our computers right now, it's kind of heartbreaking sometimes. People are using our computers for legal work, for... Uh, uh, family law, family law issues and for employment. And so we're going to be studying how to give more computer time to people. That's something that we're going to be looking at is more computers, more time on each computer as well. So 
citizenship, I notice that uh, other cities do that quite much, quite a bit. So I, I think we can add that as a service. I just, uh, my brother and his husband just moved here from Turkey and um, I just was helping my brother-in-law um, fill out his green card application. And I don't know, first of all, how uh, folks who, without help, and you know, most of the time it's expensive help, are able to do that on their own, especially if they don't have a firm grasp of the language. I, I was shocked by the process and I was thinking that that it would be a wonderful thing for the library to be able to help people in their path to citizenship and their path to legal um, work. Um, if we could, if we could have uh, be a resource in some way for that, because it's it, it's quite a process. Excellent. I think we can do that. Um, there are a number of relief organizations in Spokane we can partner with as well. That's great. Thank you, Paul. All right, any other questions for Paul? All right, thank you very much, Paul. That was very informative about the new structure for operations. I'm excited about um, your goals for the future. Thank you. All right, do we have any um, additional agenda items or changes at this point? All right, hearing none, um, were any public comments received that we need to address at the meeting? Nope. Okay. All right, uh, our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, June 15th. And I don't believe we have an executive session today. Correct. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, we are ready to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, Lara. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Great meeting. Have a good night. See y'all later.